Hello everyone, thank you for joining me. This is lecture number four. We are still on chapter two. Just a little quick recap. Mr. Spencer is talking to Holden, so Holden arrived to Old Spencer's house and is in the room. And we're, we left off when they're having a conversation and he mentions that Dr. Thurmer said that life is a game that you play by the rules. And Old Spencer reiterated that and said, life is a game, you do play by the rules. So we're picking up on page 12. If you're following along, this is Holden. Yes, sir, I know it is, I know it. Game my ass, some game. If you get on the side where all the hot shots are, then it's a game, all right, I'll admit that. But if you get on the other side where there aren't any hot shots, then what's a game about it? Nothing, no game. So Holden reiterates, and when he says he knows it's a game, and he says, I know it, pay attention to that, like we mentioned before, you're trying to figure out where Holden, uh, what Holden is actually thinking, whether it be, or if he's telling the truth or telling a lie. He reiterates twice, so it's it's almost like he really wants someone to believe him, but it could be because he's telling a lie or because he's really telling the truth and he's just uncertain and insecure with his own, his own statements that he feels the need to try to convince whoever he's speaking to or the audience, the reader, therapist, that he's telling the truth. So. It's up to you to decide on this one, but this one clearly, he is not, uh, he's not telling the truth because immediately after he gives you his real, his real thoughts, but he doesn't tell Mr. Spencer because I don't think he wants to get into a kind of disagreement. He's just trying to move on because as you hear it, it's like when a parent or someone's teaching you a lesson and you just don't think that the argument's really worth the effort and times so you're like, yeah, I know, I know, I know. But deep down you have different thoughts. You're, you just don't express them because you think it's just going to cause a huge hassle and it's not really worth it. And you may not even convince the person it's just going to cause more animosity between you two, whether it be a parent or a romantic partner. So it's kind of like he's pushing it off. But here is why it's hard to understand Holden as you may already know is that there's certain times where he really does seem like he's telling the truth when he, when he doubles up on an answer. But then there's moments when like here, he's telling a lie. So you can't really catch a pattern of this behavior. If this was something, if he reiterated something like this, yes, I know it is, I know it. Or when he says it really is, it really was, after he mentioned something, then perhaps we can catch, uh, begin to start deciphering Holden's words and what he really thinks. And then he won't be so unreliable because we, we understand him. But here it's kind of throwing, um, kind of making things a little more confusing because I do, uh, maybe you agree with me in previous chapters when he's done this, I agreed with, I trusted him. I think that he was just uncertain, but he was telling the truth here, definitely a lie. And I'm curious to know what kind of life uh, Holden believes is for people who aren't, you know, hot shots, which I'm assuming he is referring to those who are considered lower class, those who do not have money, right, living in poverty. He says there's no game for them. But one can argue that they have their, their game too. They're still in the game of society. They still have to abide by the rules of some sort. But I think, I think if we start looking into what he's really trying to say, I think we kind of can understand. It's at least different games. The people that aren't, like the rules differ for social classes. Anyone who doesn't believe that is either blind, right? Willfully ignorant, willfully blind, or just lying. And there is there's, there is those people, uh, I've seen it on both sides, right? Especially there's certain classes of individuals that think it's like old aristocracy where they don't see why the peasants are upset, right? They don't understand, they're like, I don't get it. Why are they so mad? Why do they want to rebel against us? Or why do they want to rebel against the government? And similar things happen too. There's, everything is nuanced, not to get into politics, but uh, there's certain people that are really, really far too conservative, like really conservative. They don't understand why certain people are upset. They don't see the, some horrors that do exist inside America. They're, they're very blind to it because they're living in this bubble that life just seems very, very comfortable for them and there's nothing to really worry about. And I think a little thing is kind of similar here. Also, it's obvious to us all that if you're, if you're wealthy, for instance, you can get away with far much, far more because you have more influence, power, and money 
that you can afford and that good lawyers, you, they know, they have connections, they can get you out of every, everything. People who are famous and rich practically are above the law versus those who are poor and have no influence and power. And this has always been a thing since earliest times of civilization. If you're somebody who has money, who has power, who has connections, you can get away with a lot more. Versus somebody, if you're like someone in the bottom of the social strata that exists always, then unfortunately you're you're kind of screwed. And that's just, I think what Holden's hinting at in regards to, you know, various, no, there's no game for these people, but there's a game for other ones. I think he's trying to say that there's different rules and these rules are not, they don't apply to everyone equally. I mean, even O.J. Simpson got away with murder, which is crazy, right? That's like something we all can agree is bad and most people knew he was guilty, but. And I don't think uh, Mr. Spencer, uh, Holden speaks his mind to Mr. Spencer for two reasons. And one of them I already mentioned about just, it's not worth it. But also I think he doesn't want to disagree with them because he's this figure of authority in a way. He's an elder. He may try to be respectful and polite and it may just come off very disrespectful for someone who is more, you know, is, is young to, to disagree with someone that's older, which is unfortunate. But if there is that sort of bias where if a youth is arguing with someone who's older than them, there it feels like that person's being like a disrespectful youth, right? Even if the older individual is completely wrong or unjustified in this this uh, argument or confrontation, which is unfortunate. And I've seen that too. It's almost as if the elder is always right no matter what they say just because of their age. And I think that just causes animosity between the two and the the teen is more is less likely to listen to the older person because they think they're just foolish because they're saying foolish things and they don't want to hear it they're stubborn but if they're more open and could admit it's mistakes then they could have a mutual respect for one another but it's difficult for uh, both parties right they both have their own egos but especially the the older individual like a parent that's always feeling like they're right when they're like yelling at the kid or reprimanding them, lecturing them. And they say, there's no argument, there's no discussion, right? And that just frustrates everyone because it's just, it is unfair. And the parents not doing themselves any service for future discussions and that the teen is gonna hold such resentment towards them and not go to them when they have issues. And then they wonder why the relationship is not great and why the kid doesn't go to them to discuss anything that's bothering them. And it's probably because of the way you handled previous situations. Food for thought for those people, for those parents. All right, as we turn to the book, has Dr. Thurmer written to your parents yet? Old Spencer asked me. He said he was going to write them Monday. Have you yourself communicated with them? No, sir, I haven't communicated with them because I'll probably see them Wednesday night when I get home. And how do you think they'll take the news? And from this passage, what I'm taking from it is that Mr. Spencer seems far more concerned with what the adults have to say, think, and what they feel. All these questions so far have been asking on the words and thoughts of adults. You know, he's asked about Dr. Thurmer, what he had to say. Now he's asking about Holden's parents. And why do you think that is? He's not asking about Holden himself. And I think it's just this idea of him not really respecting the youth and respecting like Holden there and really caring for him. He wants to know what other people have to say to it because I think old Spencer himself is very uncertain and is looking for peers that he can tie his opinions to and make sure they match with theirs because then he feels certain that what he's going to do is right. He doesn't want to be different from them. He doesn't have their own confidence in himself. That's my opinion, but look into it yourself, of course. And perhaps as we go through, you'll see why I formed that opinion about Mr. Spencer of him not being this kind of person who's confident and sure of himself. Back to the book. Well, they'll be pretty irritated about it, I said. They really will. This is about the fourth school I've gone to. I shook my head. I shake my head quite a lot. Boy, I said. I also say boy quite a lot. Partly because I act quite young for my age sometimes. I was 16 then, and I'm 17 now. And sometimes I act like I'm about 13. It's really ironical because I'm six foot two and a half, and I have gray hair. I really do. The one side of my head, the right side, is full of millions of gray hairs. I've had them ever since I was a kid, and yet I still act sometimes like I was only 12. Everybody says that, especially my father. It's partly true too, but it isn't all true. People always think something's all true. 
And from this passage, you can see a lot of uncertainty, a lot of Holden's typical language. I'll point out some like they'd be pretty irritated about it. And then he doubles down to say they really will, right? That they'd be irritated. He's trying to tell the truth possibly. I'm, I'm assuming that's probably the truth. Because if this is the fourth school he's gone to, his parents will be pretty irritated about it, that he keeps constantly flunking. Or at least leaving schools for some reason. Then he says, he says boy quite a lot. He shakes his head quite a lot. Partly because he acts his age for, acts young for his age. Sometimes. Sometimes I act like I'm 13. Right? And then he mentions that he has gray hair and he says he really does, which I believe is the truth. And then he says, yet I still act sometimes like I was about 12. I was only about 12. About 12. Like, there's all this uncertainty and fillers. And something that's interesting that I want to point out is Holden shakes his head, which is, you know, shaking, which is like negating life in a way, just saying no to it. While Mr. Spencer nods his head, he mentions he nods all the time, which is like affirming life, like saying yes, accepting things. And I want to know why do you think there's a contrast and I'll give you my own thoughts but think about think about it yourself one's young one's old Holden's young he he shakes his head to it he's still kind of trying to figure things out I'm assuming and I want to say perhaps uh you know he's still that youthful rebellious kind of spirit that says no to things doesn't like how certain things are is not just going to accept and say yes and I think at Mr. Spencer nodding all the time is just an indication and almost like this habit from years of getting beaten down by life that he just can't, by constantly accepting what you're getting told, accept uh, whatever someone tells you to do and you say yes to it and out of habit eventually just say yes to everything, which is very dangerous of course. And I think that's why we see this kind of contrast, one with age and youth. So perhaps over time, it does it to most people, right? When you're youthful, you're more, more likely to say no to things. You're more likely to disagree. You want to, youth usually lead new revolutions, right? They do protests most of the time. It's youth that are, are saying no to this. They don't like it. They're the one, it's needed, right? And the other one's just accepting the way life is. And they both need each other, of course, but I think it's interesting that Salinger put this in and had, like, this stuff is, when a writer is writing these things, they're not writing them for no reason at all. They're dropping hints, and we, as readers, just have to pick them up. But ask yourself, why do you think this is and start pondering on it but that's my opinion and my thought when i read this and have, what do you what do you feel like you're like at the moment do you say no to a lot still or are you feeling like you're just starting to accept life as it is and just moving along saying yes it's fine as long as i'm i have a roof over my head as long as i'm able to eat and have security i'll say yes to anything even if i disagree with certain things you know, keep your head down, disagree. Um, he has a need here to try to convince Mr. Spencer by saying they really will about his parents being irritated. And then I already mentioned his uncertain language, his generalization. Everybody says that in his slang about lousy and his exaggeration, millions of gray hair. Maybe there is millions of gray hair. I don't know how much hair we have on our heads, on our head. So, and then he, he mentions the gray hair and he's tall he acts like a child so there's this dichotomy of aging and youth that is prevalent in the entire book right the boy who's too old to stay a boy like he he can't he's like jack that film i believe it's from williams i want to say i don't remember actually no but he he can't revert back to a child because of his, of his physical appearance there's no mistaking that he's not a child but yet he's not really an adult either yet and so he has this pool, right? His psychology hasn't caught up to where his physical uh, appearance is. Physical appearance is taking the look as an adult, but his psychology is still getting pulled back into childhood and not wanting to let go of it. And so we see this struggle throughout the book. And I think we all just struggle with that. And of course there is this sort of a happy medium. I, I think 
Nietzsche said this in Thus Books Are Through Stray, I want to believe, and there's three stages he mentioned. One, the first stage is becoming a camel, you know, a beast of burden, which is primarily meaning that you carry your own responsibilities, you bear your burdens. And then once you're able to bear your own load and take on that responsibility, you can then transition into a lion, which is capable of, you know, leading, creating their own values. Well, not creating the values, but believe it's more like you can then get your own freedom. You can be the king of your own little universe. You have the ability to be like a little more fierce because you don't rely on anyone else. And then the final stage is going back to a child. And the reason for that is you now mask, you could bear your own responsibility. You had the ability to be courageous in being free because you knew that you didn't need anyone else. And then now that you have those two down, you can then revert back to a child where they have just this free expression, they're creative and therefore you can create your own values. And I think you have to transition. It's great to hold on to that. It's hard to really understand, I think, because it's hard to give up certain childhood traits, childish traits, and you don't want to lose that inner child, right? But if, you, if you're frightened to lose it, then I think you're acting out of fear. I think there's a proper growth. And then as you grow, I think that that inner child just is able to grow with you as well and still be playful, even more playful, creative. These are something, some things you could think about yourself, but I do, I know I personally struggle with that. Like I don't, it's hard for me to make that full transition sometimes because I see the seriousness and the phoniness of the adult world as well. And I participate in it just like Holden, but there's times where I still want to keep that distance and don't want to be a completely a part of it and sort of separate myself from it when, especially when it deals with like things that don't matter. Like I'm dealing with an adult and that's not affecting my work at all. And so I can act, I have a little more freedom to just to be childish or playful or not serious because I don't, this is not going to affect my livelihood, right? And I also want to point out that everybody says that he acts like he's 12, especially his father. That's what he mentions in this passage. And in the opening chapter on the first page of the book, Holden says his parents are quite touchy, especially his father. So I think this is a hint into their relationship, right? His relationship with his father, which seems to be one of like constantly disappointing his father. And it's one of those ones where like the dad just wants, the father wants a child, the son in particular to just grow up and he keeps acting like a child. If you can, I feel like you may understand this sort of relationship, seen it in the film, maybe you, maybe you have that relationship or you know a friend who has that where the father's kind of aloof to the, to the son, he doesn't really give him the proper nourishment, he just kind of expects him to be an adult, he doesn't understand why he has to act so childish and he grows frustrated with him and this the child just keeps acting out, it's quite embarrassed and he, hates disappointing him yet he keeps disappointing him because he needs that attention he doesn't know how to actually make that transition into being a man and he isn't helping him and he doesn't want to help him because he in his head he thinks that he should already learn because maybe the father himself was far more you know uh, independent and took initiative and was able to make that transition himself and he doesn't understand why his son can't do the same and then there's these times where i've seen this too is where the the father may try to blame the mother for being too, you know, nurturing or spoiling them when they were young. And it's like, because of this, you made him a child and they try to put the blame on the mother and they won't take any responsibility for themselves, which is unfortunate because then it causes a rift from them and just makes the child feel even worse and even more guilty because he feels like he is causing a rift between the parents because of his own inability to not mess up and to make the full transition into adulthood like he's supposed to, but he doesn't know how. And he's so uncertain because he doesn't want to make the wrong move because he's so concerned about not messing up, about trying to make his father proud of him. And because of that, he is messing up. Right? When you overthink things, you mess up instead of just feeling confident and comfortable. But here, when you're always worried about trying to do the right thing is when you make mistakes. And I think this is one of the, 
what we're seeing with Holden as well as anyone else you may know and perhaps you are dealing with it as well. It's this weird like paradox when you care too much it's when you mess up and the person that you're messing up and disappointing doesn't understand that you are trying extremely hard to make them proud of you or to make them happy or satisfied because to them they just don't understand why do you keep messing up why do you keep disappointing me why do you keep upsetting me and it's like because I want you please you so badly that I'm messing up and they can't see that or form that compassion. And it's unfortunate, it's very unfortunate. It's quite tragic, quite tragic actually. Okay. Also just to pose your, this question to you, you, I mentioned if you're dealing with this, think about it, but also do you remember times when your father or if this is a girl like your mother told you you were acting like a child and or something along the lines of like grow up and or why don't you grow up? What? cause that, how did you feel, and did you make the change? And I think it's interesting that Holden says people always think something's all true. And we have seen this from Holden when he exaggerates at times, right? To make something a totality saying something is all, or someone's always doing something, or never doing something, etc. And he displays it in this sentence, people always think something's all true. So it's kind of weird because he he's fully encompassing everything after just kind of hating on it too. But I also, with that statement, when he says these last two lines, it's partly true too, but it isn't all true. People always think something's all true. And I think there's some like immature wisdom that's coming out of Holden here. And it's sloppy, of course, but what he's saying is rather profound and he's understanding stuff at a deeper level, which is most of life is nuanced. So one can find things that are rarely just completely true. And I think he understands that. And then the vast majority of the world, for some reason, I think because it simplifies the world if the world is black and white, right? If it's binary, then it's easier to identify, I mean, it's easier to make the world more comprehensible you can understand actions, you know what morality is, you know what ethics are, you know the right and wrong choices. And that's something that we, we crave and yearn for because it simplifies the world. The world is very complex and we don't understand it and it frightens us when we don't understand something a lot of the time. And so we try to make the world binary, but that isn't the case. There's always bad and something that we all deem as good and there's always good and things that we deem as horrible. It's too nuanced and it's very complicated and we don't want to admit that because then it makes for these long discussions that that they could be illuminating but a lot of people want clear final answers and when that clear and definite answer isn't given people become very frustrated with it and want to reject it and think it's dumb and they want to cling to an idea that they know is certain even if it's wrong and i think holden's alluding to this with these two lines and that's frustrating for me to, uh personally i i hate when you meet people who are very stubborn like that and have to think in binary ways and the thought of something being nuanced is just completely overwhelming to them that they vehemently reject it and even grow upset because it's just it's shaking their foundation right they built their their whole ideals or ideas of morality their ideas of right and wrong the, all their beliefs on this sort of foundation which is like a house of cards and if you present any sort of information it it can knock the house of cards over because it's just, you know, flimsy. It's not built on a solid foundation. And so they they reject it because they're worried because if you knock that thing out, then what do they believe in? What do they know? It's frightening because they have nothing to stand on. They're falling down into the, to the abyss of this, just this chaos, darkness, where nothing is certain. They have nothing to grab onto to know that this is true. This is what I believe in. And so people would rather stand on a false and empty foundation, right? like a house of cards where it's just empty and hollow, so anything can knock it over, than actually trying to fig build a real foundation because it can at least give them false certainty and security. And that's all they need, it's comforting enough. And the other idea is too uncomfortable to think about. It's too scary for them. It takes a lot more effort and a lot more courage. All right, back to the book. I don't give a damn, except that I get bored sometimes when people tell me to act my age. 
Sometimes I act a lot older than I am. I really do, but people never notice it. People never notice anything. First off, I want to mention the youthful, rebellious sort of tone that we see in Holden right here when he says he doesn't give a damn, meaning he probably does care, right? It's like when people say, I don't care, and they really do care. I know I used to do that. I try not to do it anymore. I actually don't do it anymore, really. At least I haven't caught myself, but I used to do it quite a bit, especially in my early like college years and high school when people would do something that like hurt me or I really cared about and I would just say, oh, I don't care. It's, I don't care, I don't care. And you probably have done it too and you know people who do it when they truly do care. Um, we also have his ambiguous and uncertain language when he says that I get bored sometimes, sometimes I act like I'm older and then his need to convince the reader once again when he says that he really does, which I believe because we all have moments where we act childish and times where we act older than our age. And that happens constantly, at least for me throughout the day. So I don't doubt Holden's remark there. But I think it's just another example, example of how he himself is insecure and not confident and feels the need to convince someone that his word is valid. Especially here because he wants to inform the reader that he's not just childish. He wants to let us know that he can be mature. Like in the therapist, if he's talking to her or him. And like I said, I'm sure it's true, but it's probably really important to him and his ego and his psychology, his psyche, to know to for to know that we understand that he is capable of that. And some people need that encouragement and they need you to believe them. And it means a lot to them that you do. It's especially for a teenager, it must Right, like at this time, they need that certainty. They need people to to say like, yeah, I believe you. And that way they don't feel like they're constantly on on the defense and have to try to, con like they're guilty and they have to constantly prove to the whole world because they're, they're trying, they're, new, they're growing into this adulthood and they're trying to prove themselves to others and to the world. And so at this moment, they're just feeling, that's where they have this kind of like anger and resentment and this energy that's kind of has this bitterness already to it a lot of the times. You see this with young people because they're trying to prove themselves and it feels like everyone is, if they want to think like the world's out to get them, but it's not really, but that's how they feel. They take on this energy. And so it's so nice when you have somebody that understands you and believes you and you don't have to feel as if you have to exert so much effort and energy to try to convince somebody. And it's relieving to allow someone to mature when you realize that you don't need to try to convince everybody just by acting it out will convince people more so than words. And I can personally sympathize with Holden in his statement about getting bored when people tell him to act his age. And I sort of just uh, mentioned this in this podcast previously, but uh, you know, maturity with maturity comes responsibility and there are things one must do when they're adult that is indeed tedious and boring, but it's, but the vast majority of life, you don't have to be that serious. I feel like 90% of life, if not more, like 95% of life can be taken with like lightheartedness. You don't have to be so serious about things. You can get things done and just have fun with it. And there's very minimal amount of times where you have to be very serious. And it calls for you not to be childish or playful. But that's rare. And so I try to add that fun in a lot of the times, but especially in conversations on like dating gaps with women, but it, it's picked up wrong and it never works out for me, unfortunately, but I'm trying to keep it fun and light because I don't think it should, that deserves it to be serious. And I just think it's more enjoyable to act like a child a lot of the times. And I think you may agree if you feel that way. And then it's frustrating when someone doesn't play along or doesn't know how to take you. And that's always quite annoying. And it does make you feel rather lonely and detached frustrated with the world and perhaps you isolate more because of it because you're trying to allow invite people to play it's like a child or have you seen a dog they've been like they've been down they move around they're trying to invite you to play with them and if i feel like it's like that some of the times or like children when they're trying to get you to play you know there's this little acting out prior to see if you're you're in this game with them and they're inviting you and if you don't do it it's quite disappointing you know they get sad like dogs look like they're about to cry 
children like drop their heads or drop the toy and walk off and it's very sad and so I don't know about you but sometimes I feel that way is you know you try to invite someone to play and be a little childish and realize like okay you don't have to be this and it's so fulfilling when someone does join into the game and you guys both kind of play off one another and create this imaginary world like you do when you're children but you're doing it with an adult so it's quite fun because it's allowing both of you to step out of you know the banality of the world and the phoniness that does the fake politeness and yeah that's great but the other one's always it's bad when they don't play along and don't know what you're doing and you're just like okay I'm in this joke myself and sometimes it's amusing because you can continue with the sarcasm and someone's not picking it up you could continue to say outrageous things until the person just finally thinks you're just weird and walks away I did that recently with someone who wasn't picking up that I was kidding about a lot and just kept going with it until finally they just kind of walked away like in a polite manner like okay it was nice to meet you Meaning like, okay, get me out of here. Um, also, I think Holden understands that that you have there's times to be serious because he says, I get bored sometimes, which may display his knowledge and understanding that there are times when he must act mature and like an adult and be serious, which is why he immediately follows that statement by saying, sometimes I act a lot older than I am, I really do. Because I really do think he understands. I really do, really. I, I do think he understands that there is a time for being mature. And he's at the age, right, when he knows that there is a time to be serious and there's a time not to be. And I think he's trying to make the case that he does understand when he's pleading up with the I really do about he, he really does act older than he is. I mean, I think he does that for multiple reasons, but I think that's another reason why he's really like almost pleading with you, like, trust me, I understand. And I do do it when I need to. Act older, that is. And he has an overgeneralization in which he says people never notice anything. And this is an example of something being partly true. People don't notice much, granted. But to say people never notice anything is false. But you can sense Holden's disappointment and youthful cynicism pouring out in this paragraph. It's all pretty revealing and telling into Holden's character, right? I think this paragraph contains every element of Holden's character, and one should look into it a few times because many things are hidden here and may not be, be perceived upon the first reading. This goes with Holden saying people never notice anything. It's as if he is desperately clamoring and like pleading for the reader to listen to him, to hear him, to understand him, to know that he's struggling He's hurting and for us to notice and I want you to take a look the start of the book the first sentence of the book if you remember if not take the time to take out your book and look it up I'll just say it he says if you really want to hear about it that's how he starts the book so if we care enough to listen to him to notice him to want to know since like many of us especially during the teenage years you feel like you aren't noticed right that you don't really have a voice that no one really wants to hear from you because they think you're foolish, immature, unwise, right? have nothing to teach someone or say, which is false. I mean, of course, as teens and as children, we are foolish, we're immature, and we're quite unwise. But that doesn't mean our thoughts and opinions at the age don't matter. That doesn't mean the feelings that we feel don't matter. And I think a lot of the times when we're growing up, we feel that way because of the way the world treats us in regards to the adult world. Teenagers can kind of understand each other, but they're all so uncertain that it's hard. You know, they kind of wallow in that that annoyance with the adult world because no one's listening to them, no one's respecting them, no one's hearing them out, and they're making it seem like all their problems are are unimportant. And they want to tell you them that in the grand scheme of life, they are unimportant, but in their lives, they are important. And I hate when people try to say that to kids especially like high school high school kids when they say like all oh, this doesn't matter like who cares if you're not having a great time it's like it matters to them they're living through it so it's the it definitely does matter they're not gonna look down at their life like yeah they're living it right now and that can really shape who they become and people don't understand that either and also just to go back really quickly and touch upon the idea that teens, people don't really think they have anything important to say, which is false, but I think 
we can learn something from everyone, including children. Sometimes children say the most profound and wise things. They have an understanding. Not, of course, most of the time they're not. I can go to them for advice. But if you actually listen to them, sometimes I do say something that really gets a thought thinking. You're like, wait, you are right. It's quite remarkable. I think you can learn something from everybody. I mentioned this in previous podcasts. And I do think it's true. And to go back to where this paragraph is, where Holden's at, let's just reread it one more time. I don't give a damn, except I get bored sometimes when people tell me to act my age. Sometimes I act a lot older than I am. I really do, but people never notice it. People never notice anything. And I wanted to read it one, once more because I have personally have suffered with this cynicism as a teen. And I would probably, I don't think it's going to be that extreme of a hypothesis if I say all of you have at some point in your life as well had this kind of overgeneralization, this cynicism where you're like, no one listens to me. The whole world doesn't listen. No one pays attention. You want to just group everybody because you're so frustrated because the vast majority of people that you do encounter or when you look out into the world, you feel like it's just all bad. No one listens. The world is stupid, whatever whatever your opinion may be. And that's not true. There's going to be, a, it may not be the vast majority, but there are people in this world that you will be able to relate to, that you will love and care about and who will love and care about you for who you are. It's just maybe a little more difficult. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, we all feel that way, like that no one pays attention. Even when you become an adult, you see it, you deal with it when you feel as if people aren't paying attention to you or really listening to what you say or they're not interested in what you have to say and it's frustrating and it can make you grow coarse and cold but you can't let it make you grow bitter. You have to try to find an outlet for it, try to laugh it off and understand that that little charm that you do have which is your true self and perhaps isn't everyone's cup of tea, right? It's someone, it's most, it's like a unique flavor that most people don't want but there's going to be some people that are going to be crazy about it and that makes your flavor more sought after to those. It makes it more special, more unique, more of a treasure for those who really are seeking it. So hold on to that if you feel that way, if you feel as if for you personally, because there's some individuals who are like, like a, if we're using this food analogy, like a vanilla, right? Or like a chocolate, these, these common beloved flavors that you're gonna find a lot of people that are gonna enjoy it. It may not be, you know, there's some people who are like a cookies and cream, a little a little more personality to it, but it's still very enjoyable to most people. Like people see it like, oh yeah, I want that. But vanilla, chocolate, you know, they're they're kind of basic, but everyone enjoys them. There's these personalities and people you meet that are like that, that, that develop this charisma, this charm. They know how to play. Let's use the same metaphors in this book. They know how to play the game. You meet, you've met these people, I'm sure, or you're even, you even enjoy them. Like there's, a sort of fakeness to them, but you can tell they're good natured, right? But they just know how to be polite to everybody. They know how to, they remember people's names. They talk to everybody, they're friends with everyone. They, they know how to operate within every circle. And those personalities, of course, just a, a mass, a wide net, and they are able to just incorporate many connections and have many friends. And perhaps you think like what they do sometimes is fake, which it is, but they know how to be charismatic. And then you may have this own personality that's a little more distinct and unique. If you have a more unique personality, what I'm saying is like you may be like an exotic flavor, <laughs> right, right? These various flavors you see uh, at ice cream shops that don't get picked that often, but maybe you're trying it out because you're like, oh, that's interesting. And certain people may love love that. And those who do love it will cherish you because of it. So don't get down on yourself and don't try to change yourself too much. But you do have to, if you want to be able to operate in this world, you have to learn, like you have to play some certain, you have to play a little bit of the rules, I think. I think there's no way around it. There's certain things that work and connections work and small things about charisma really do work. For instance, like remembering people's names, greeting people to smile. Um, I'm not very charismatic, so I'm not the most, uh, I'm not the person to 
really educate you on this, but there's so many YouTube videos now, like charisma schools, and they teach you how to be charismatic, or they pick out uh, certain traits from various celebrities who do interviews, right? And they show you how, what charisma they're, they portray, and they try to adapt it for your personality. Like, look up those videos and you can see it. They're trying to adapt it to your personality so it don't change immensely, but you at least know how to just build on your skill set so you can attract more people if you want to be successful and make these kind of influential connections because unfortunately life is about connections and really about who you know it really comes down to that that's more important than anything else i think so let's get back to the book old spencer started nodding again he also started picking his nose. He made out like he was pinching it, but he was really getting the old thumb right in there. I guess he thought it was all right to do because it was only me that was in the room. I didn't care, except that it was pretty disgusting to watch somebody pick their nose. Okay, here's old Spencer nodding again. He's just kind of agreeing, going through life, right? Understanding, because this is after um, he mentions mentions his parents being irritated and say it's the fourth school he, got, he went to so it's like all right all right cool cool he's agreeing right like yeah 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 I'm, I'm glad like okay your parents are irritated that's the right thing for them to do so i'm irritated with you now so this is the right thing i should be doing how i should be acting towards you sort of idea and also it's i've mentioned the opposite of ages and then there's opposite in the regards that one's a student one's a teacher right one's agreeing one's disagreeing the accepting and rejecting of life and in rules so he's agreeing with the way that his parents are irritated with them right and also in this passage old spencer is made to look repulsive in our eyes if we're just picturing this old man who's dirty who's sick who's wearing an old bathrobe who's hunched over and now he's picking his nose so this is not like a respectable gentleman like an old man who's in a nice like tailored suit right cleaned up maybe smoking a pipe has some glasses he looks refined he looks noble he looks like he has wisdom just seeping out of his pores so yeah this is definitely not him but personally speaking this is something i can't handle if i'm just going off tangent like boogers people picking their nose bothers me it grosses me out there's a lot of things i don't mind like i can handle throw up for instance like i've seen friends throw up during like partying days and that's never bothered me but Bo like bugs don't bother me either, but boogers bother me. And I see that, I just, ugh, I feel like gagging. I, I feel like throwing up and especially people picking their nose, it bothers me. I n actually never did because thankfully I was very vain as a little kid. And my mother told me that it would make my nostrils like very large if I kept picking at them. And so I didn't want that. Therefore, I didn't pick my nose. <laughs> I think it's quite humorous too, if you've ever driven on like a freeway or in anywhere, and you're at a stoplight, you look over the amount of drivers that pick their nose, it's absurd. You'd see it, I saw it at least once every time just traveling to work, which was like 15 minutes away, at least once, multiple times typically. And especially when you're like a dead stop traffic in a freeway, you'll see it so much that people just pick their nose and they act like, people think like when they're in their vehicle, they're just completely unseen with the world, unless you have window tents that are illegal, that are so dark that they're, they're not supposed to be that dark. People are going to see into your car and they can see everything. Some of them are kind of funny though, like I love people who are singing and dancing, like as if no one's watching and no one could see them. Those are some of my favorites. But the pick in the nose is just so gross and people just dig up in there and they just do not care. Or if you look in the in your, uh, your rear view mirror and you see the person behind you just digging their nose, it's yeah, so gross. And I also think there's a slight just embarrassment and shame displayed by old Spencer here because he is somewhat disguising what he's doing, like his action. Like he knows what he's doing is gross, but in the same, at the same time, he kind of is like Holden mentions, he, he, I guess he thought it was all right to do because it was just me in the room. Like I do think he, he thinks like, okay, this is wrong for me to do, but it's just the guys. So maybe I can get away with it. I don't have to really worry. It's not like, he's around a bunch of professionals or his peers, right? Or if it was his entire class, 
it's different. It's, I would, I would describe it as something as if, if you're with a friend, for instance, that's just a guy, you may burp out loud when it's just him, even though you know it's bad, you may try to hide it, or there's certain people that when it's just you and them, you and him, and you guys aren't that close, but he'll he'll like try to hide his part, but then do it, and if you hear it, he'll just admit it because he's kind of like teetering on the idea of like, is this okay, is this not okay? I think he understands like hold him, will like excuse it, right? Like yeah, he'll ignore it. He'll act like he won't completely uh, call it out, but he's seen it, but I think he just won't say anything about it. And this happens also at like public restrooms before COVID time. It still kind of happens actually, but especially before COVID time where you would see you go to the bathroom. This is for more men than women. I don't know if women do this, but definitely men's restroom. They know what I'm talking about. When you go to the bathroom and you're at a urinal and you, you're done using it and you, you see the person uh, washing their hands and they don't wash their hands. They just stick their hand under the water for one second, dry it off and leave. So they give the impression that they are doing washing their hands, but they're not even doing it. Like but they don't want to just walk out the door because that's just completely wrong, right? Like if if Mr. Spencer was just digging into his nose without even trying to pretend that he was trying to hide it, there could be, that would be a little too much, right? It'd be too much, it's, it's too shameful to do that. It's too insolent to do that. But, and same thing with the bathroom washing, it seems almost more insolent, more obscene to just walk out without even pretending that you, you care enough to wash your hands. It's going through the motion, it's doing the social, kind of a contract like okay after we go to public bathrooms we're supposed to wash our hands everyone expects it so let's just pretend i'm doing i know what to do it's it's like reminding everyone else that looks at you with that shame like okay i know i'm supposed to wash my hands and i'm gonna do the bare minimum to show that i understand the rules but i know that you don't care enough to stop me and tell me to wash my hands so i'm just gonna walk out and that's what i see with people i'm just like what but yeah like holden i see it i'm quite i'm quite disgusted with it but at the same time, I don't care enough to say like, hey, you should be washing your hands for 20 seconds. At least do it for 10 seconds, <laughs> right? But let's move on. Back to the book. Then he said, I had the privilege of meeting your mother and dad when they had their little chat with Dr. Thurmer some weeks ago. They're grand people. Yes, they are. They're very nice. Grand. That There's a word I really hate. It's a phony. I could puke every time I hear it. So Holden uses his, one of his favorite adjectives, which is nice when he's describing people, right? He calls his parents very nice, which he did in the beginning of the book, he called them nice. And he calls the word grand phony, but he's blind to his own hypocrisy in this passage. I mean, he's, he's hypocritical a lot of the time in the book, but especially here, because it's obvious that he's being phony too when he says that his parents are very nice, but to him, that's somehow not phony. He calls him grand. He says, yes, very nice. So he's playing along. He's not going to mention everything about them. Because right? it's not very nice and grand can be thought of as very similar. If Hold, if he didn't say grand, it, he said they're very nice people, Holden would probably assume that that's still being phony. But it's always easier to see faults in others. People are like mirrors. They reflect us whether good or bad. And often we do not realize it. Things that often annoy us about someone or the same qualities that we possess. And they're usually qualities that we hate of in ourselves, but even like, like we'll see something and someone does something that we like, and it may be something that we personally do and we like about ourselves, but especially stuff that bothers us. If you live with someone who's close or you have a coworker or a friend and they do certain things that really bother you, a lot of the times you don't realize that that's something you do yourself and you hate it, but you're seeing it reflected back at you. It's one of the reasons why it's like a, I hate seeing these kind of cliches or platitudes, right? It's, a, it's like an old bromide is the idea that people don't get along because they're, they're too much alike, right? That you butt heads because they're too much alike, which is true because you have the same qualities and you see it often with families. They're like a, maybe a daughter's so much like her father and they butt heads all the time, but they're both just very stubborn and opinionated. Right. I mean, there's tons of examples. I'm sure you can think of them too, where someone you're close to and you guys are, you two butt heads all the time. You, you get in confrontation, conflict. You guys, you annoy them at times. They annoy you. And then someone calls it out and says, well, you two are so alike. 
And this is a certain kind of same idea I'm alluding to is being able to see other qualities that you have in someone else and they bother you. But if you were to make amends with them and with yourself and understand them, you could be more sympathetic and compassionate to the other and you can start beginning to empathize with one another and have a better relationship. Also, Old Spencer's just being polite, not only with Grand, but he says that he had the privilege of meeting Holden's parents. And we're familiar with this sort of polite and phony culture, right? Like if someone meets somebody, especially when a teacher meets your parents, they're like, wow, I, ha I had the privilege. I had the privilege of meeting your parents and they're just grand people. And it just all sounds ridiculous, right? But you have to say those certain things, just like Mrs. Spencer had to say, tell Holden that it was lovely that he stopped by. Lovely to see you, right? That's a privilege to, to meet them. Is it really your privilege? Did, they li did he line up to meet his parents? I doubt it. But if you don't say those certain things, you just come off very rude. You want to be polite. And then Holden clearly hates this kind of phoniness. Yeah, because he says grand is a word I really hate. <laughs> he explicitly says he hates it. And he doesn't say sort of hate it, I hate sometimes. He also says concretely that it's a phony. Not it's sort of phony, it's phony and all. So let me reread it to you. Grand, there's a word I really hate, it's a phony. He's direct, he's certain, he knows that he does not like it. He won't, you won't catch Holden using the word grand at least. He'll use nice, but he won't use grand. And then Holden uses hyperbole when he's saying that he could puke every time. He, here is the word phony. All right, this is going to be the last passage we're going to read for this podcast. We're still on page 14. Here's the book. Then all of a sudden, Old Spencer looked like he had something very good, something sharp as a tack, to say to me. He sat up more in his chair and sort of moved around. It was a false alarm, though. All he did was lift the Atlantic Monthly off his lap and try to chuck it on the bed next to me. He missed. It was only about two inches away, but he missed anyway. I got up and picked it up and put it down on the bed. So once again, we see the unremarkable gesture and action of Old Spencer. And previously, he mentioned the piece of chalk, him dropping a piece of chalk and not being able to pick it up himself, having to rely on his, the students to pick it up for him. And here he can't even toss a magazine to a bed that's a few inches away. And he needs a child to hold in one of his students to help him do his simple task. And I think in the idea of Joseph Campbell, you know, the hero's journey, the encounter with the old wise man, it, we're clearly starting to realize that Mr. Spencer isn't this wise man. He's the antithesis of it, and I think Salinger does it perfectly for that reason. And as we continue in the next lecture, I mean, the yeah, the next lecture, next podcast, you will see why Mr. Spencer isn't the wise man. But just even here, just to reiterate, he is incapable of handling even the simplest of tasks. He can't do even the simplest of tasks Mr. Spencer cannot complete himself. He relies on children to help him as well. He's uncertain. He's not competent. He can't bear, like, bear his own burden. He can't take responsibility. And yeah, it's painting a picture of this kind of helpless old man who is too blind to see certain things. And I won't get ahead of our, our lecture, so I won't mention Old Spencer more, but I'll discuss him in greater length as we continue with chapter two. So we're leaving off on page 14. Uh, thank you for listening. I just have to cut up this podcast a little short today because I have time constraints. But thank you for listening, and we will pick it up again, like I said, chapter two, and the next lecture. Thank you. Bye.